uh, ordained in May of 2004. He is currently um, the assistant biology professor and instructor in theology at Providence College, Rhode Island. And also, um, I just quickly do a little educational introduction here. Uh, at, he completed his doctoral degree in biology from Massachusetts Institute of Technology. And after completing his doctoral studies, he was a fellow of the International Human Frontier Science Program at the Ludwig Institute for Cancer Research at the University College in London. Um, he has just spoken uh, as uh, part of a group of that at the Vatican on adult stem cell research. Uh, he was with the Holy Father. Um, the conference was entitled Adult Stem Cells, Science and the Future of Man and Culture. And it gathered 350 scientists, religious figures, politicians, educators, and industry representatives. Father spoke on will the advancement of life sciences change our vision of man. Father has uh, done written a book, which is out, is it out? Tomorrow, I Tomorrow. think. Tomorrow. Oh, wonderful. You have the name of <laughs> An introduction to Catholic bioethics. Uh, he's done many, many uh, essays on science and theology, um, a lot of professional presentations. Uh, this is only a little part of it. Um, but also, Father, to me, importantly, is uh, a dear, dear friend of our community. And we're proud to have him with us today to speak to us on such an important topic. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, th uh, first, we should pray. In the name of the Father, and the Son, of the Holy Spirit, amen. amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, Amen. I'd like to begin first by thanking Mother and the community for their wonderful hospitality over the years. Um, I come here to rest, and it's been... It's, um, it's just been wonderful to come here and, and share the time and the prayer with my sisters. And uh, when Mother asked me to come here to Hawthorne to give a talk on end-of-life issues, I jumped at the opportunity to come here and to speak about that. So um, it's striking. We, you know, I wanted to start with the Ave, Our Lady's Prayer, to highlight the very key point here that every time we pray the Hail Mary, we are thinking, anticipating, hoping, and praying for the end of our life. So when you pray the Hail Mary, you are dealing with the end of life. And so what I'd like to do today is to discuss the ethics of the end of life. I'd like to do it in, th in three different parts. First of all, we need to talk about death. So often in my ministry and service as a Catholic chaplain, so I was a Catholic chaplain for several summers at the New York Cornell Presbyterian Hospital down in the city because the Dominican friars of my province have an apostolate there. We have St. Catherine of Siena Parish and so one of the apostolates of the brethren who are assigned to that house is to serve as chaplains for the hospitals in that region. And so for two summers, first as a deacon and then as a young dad. So young dads are the first year of, as a priest were young dads. Okay, so, so my, young, my young dad year was spent, the summer of my young dad year, was spent at New York Cornell Presbyterian, basically with a pager on call. I was the young one. I was the one running at 2 o'clock in the morning, praying the Hail Mary. You know, so, so when you get a call and if someone's dying, they bled out, and the doctors are, well, it's time for the priest. You know, I get paged, then I go running. And I go in there, and um, usually if the patient has died or is dying, we pray. And then it's striking. Afterwards, I have to care for the pastoral and spiritual care, not only for 
the patient's family and those who have survived him. But so often, and this was something that I didn't expect, so much of my pastoral care dealt with the doctors, the nurses, the healthcare providers, because they too have to deal with the death of their patient. And so end of life care is something that, um, in a sense, for six months while I was serving as chaplain, I got an intimate behind the scenes look at at how we deal with it here in our culture in the 21st century in these United States of America. And when we talk about end of life care, so often we don't talk about death. And so I need to talk first about death. What exactly is death and how do we talk about death and how do we think about death? And then what I'd like to do is in my time that I have served as a hospital chaplain, I've discovered that People who are dying basically have to deal and grapple with two things that they fear. Now, there are many things that we fear at the end of our lives. But there are two fears that, that in a sense, have bioethical import. The first is, a lot of patients fear that death will be incredibly painful. And so we need to deal with how do we respond to that fear? How can we alleviate in morally virtuous ways the pain that people think they will experience or are experiencing at the end of life? Second, and even more important, I think it's very um, striking how when I talk to people who are at the end of their lives, what they fear is prolonged dying. And you, you see a lot of people, they're scared to die, hooked up to machines, hooked up to different tubes. I've had patients tell me, Father, I'm ready to go. I'm ready to go. And so we need to talk about what can one do virtuously at the end of one's life to make sure that the dying process is not unnecessarily prolonged. So that the encounter with the risen Lord, which is what death is all about, comes about peacefully and with much grace. And then I'm going to conclude my talk this day by just talking about, in a sense, how do we who are not at the end of our lives, how do we anticipate and prepare for that? So I'd like to talk very briefly about things like healthcare proxies, advanced healthcare directives, living wills, and the things that we need to do to make sure that we can, in fact, be allowed to die virtuously and gracefully and hopefully uh, strengthened by the, by the sacraments of the church at the very end of our life. So it, there, those are the topics I really want to cover over the course of the next 45 minutes or so. And then I'd like to just open up the floor to any questions that you may have or even discussion if you have things that you would like to talk about. So first, death. I remember going into a hospital room uh, at New York Cornell Presbyterian where I accidentally came across a patient who was not a Catholic. And what I meant by that is on the register of patients, every, every morning we'd go in, they'd hand us a list of all the incoming, the patients who had come in the, in the previous 24 hours who were Catholic, and we would go visit them. And I remember walking in to talk to a patient and she's like, I'm not Catholic. And I was like, oh, I apologize for that. You're listed as Catholic. And uh, she says, yeah, I don't believe in God. And I unexpectedly blurted out, oh, I'm sorry to hear that. <laughs> and uh, she was a little shocked. Um, she was a little shocked. And I was, you, you know, I was trained better. You know, you're not supposed to say... And she goes, what do you mean? I said, well, who do you think at the end of the day? And she was stunned. I said, and she goes, what do you mean? I said, well, I thank God every night for the incredible day that I've had. I said, who do you think? And she, the very notion of gratitude, I think, surprised her. But what ended up happening is that providential encounter led to conversations. And I learned a lot from her, and hopefully by the grace of God, she was able to hear something about the truth of the gospel from our conversations. But one of the striking things I discovered is that for many people today, and she was characteristic of the situation, death is an incredibly mysterious thing that is really like a black hole, an abyss 
into which you are going to pass. And you're not really sure what's on the other side. And so there's a lot of fear. There's a lot of fear because, not surprisingly, if you don't know where you're going to go, you're going to be scared that you will get lost. And even worse, as this woman uh, revealed to me, there was a fear that she basically would simply disappear. That life, that death was simply annihilation. That death was simply the end of everything, everything that she valued. And so in the course of our conversations, I was able to share with her how the gospel, especially the life, the death of the Lord Jesus, the Savior of the world, and tomorrow we will celebrate He is the King of the universe. I was able to share the vision of death that the gospel promises to all who wishes to explore it. And in many ways, Pope Benedict the 16th, you know, he, he always says that we do not impose the gospel. All we do is we propose it. We propose it. We say, you are looking for answers about death. This is one answer. Now, we are convicted both by faith and reason that this is the answer. This is the truth. But this is something that you have to discover for yourself, especially, hopefully, God willing, after an encounter with the risen Lord. You know, you will not really know what death is truly about until you meet Him who has conquered death. And so we begin, what is death? And something I need to remind you, because hopefully you have discovered it in your life, that death is not the end. That is... If the gospel tells us one thing, it is that death is not the end. Death, in fact, is a homecoming. And the story that I always have in my mind is the prodigal son, who goes off to a foreign country, away from his father's house, and he has to deal with the messiness of that other country. And then he longs to come home. And the Christian is called to live that longing. The longing for the life to come. The longing for the Father's house. And that death is a necessary, it's only necessary because of sin. It was not supposed to be. But death is a necessary part of that homecoming. It's that 27 hour flight that you must take if you want to go visit your parents in Manila. That's me. <laughs> you know, it's that incredible, it's long, it's tiring, it's exhausting, but I get to see mom and dad. <laughs> and we bear it. We bear it now, especially with all these TSA regulations you get, ah, oh, you know, I have to go through it again, and now they're going to pat down this and pat down that. And, but we endure it. We're not scared of it because we hope and long for what comes after. And so it's most important at, the, at this beginning of this conversation about end of life that we be, think that way. That what we have to do when we think about the end of life is we need to think about, I am preparing for a journey home. And that as we help each other to prepare for that homeward journey, there are certain things that we need to keep in mind. Because we are going to meet the Lord the creator of the universe, and his beautiful mother. And that vision has to capture us. Because death, as our Savior himself experienced, is not necessarily the most pleasant of things. He endured a difficult, painful death. The most painful, especially because of the purity of his heart, and the sinlessness of his very being. And yet, he allowed himself to experience death, the pain of death, the suffering of death, and then of course the resurrection, to remind us that where we are going, he has gone before. And so we always have to keep in mind, we are, as we approach death, we are not only going home, but our Savior has gone before us on this way. And it gives us the source of our hope and the source of our, of our immortality. I mean, 
you know, my students at Providence College will ask me about death. And I'll say, well, I know that this my Savior sweat blood when he thought of the end of his life. And because of that, you and I are allowed to, to fear death in some way. And yet, I know what the other side is the resurrection. And then I get to see, as I've told the sisters, you know, I look forward to my resurrected body. 33 years old, according to Aquinas, because it's the perfect age. If the Lord is 33 today, you and I are going to be 33 just like Him. It was good enough for Him, it's going to be good for enough for us. And it's going to be an amazing body, right? Because I... The, I'm going to check out the center of the... I, one of the things, I, I'm a geek. I'm a geek for God. That's what Dominicans are. And um, I've always wanted to explore the black hole, Sagittarius A, at the center of our, the, the Milky Way. Well, one day, with my glorified body, God willing, I'll be able to go there at the twinkle of an eye. And so we need to remember that. We need to remember as we are approaching death, that our bodies are going through a period of transformation and purification. But the promise is strong on the other side. But now, how about the reality of this side? I told you there are two fears. There are two, the first is the fear of pain, and the second is the fear of prolonged dying. And so there are moral questions that arise with that. So I'm going to deal first with the question of, fe of the fear of pain. sister has got me to promise that I will not so these capooses are not meant to they're 800 year old so <laughs> middle age garb doesn't quite work with 21st century technology um, but, but what we have to keep in mind here right is that first of all it is natural to fear death and to fear the pain of death so when I speak to patients who voice the fear of death, I say, that's okay. It is okay to fear death because death is the greatest of all evils. And what I mean by that is not a moral evil, which is what we do when we commit sin of some sort, but it's a metaphysical evil. It is an absence, the absence of life. And so, not surprisingly, when we encounter evil, we face fear. And so this is a natural passion that we have to deal with. And so, first thing is, it's okay to be afraid. But now, we need to reassure our brother and sister who is dying that there are two things that we can help to do to alleviate that fear. First, there is the, in a sense, the natural, and then there is the supernatural. So the natural is when it comes to pain. One of the things I discovered at New York Cornell Presbyterian is that given 21st century medicine, we have, not 100%, but we have the technology to, to make sure that people who are dying do not necessarily have to die in pain. And I think that we need to just be reminded of that. I remember when I was a little boy visiting a man dying from cancer. Uh, it was a hospital in Seattle. I was 11 years old. And it's one of those things that you... And he was screaming for his mother. He was in so much pain that he was screaming for his mother. And he basically died screaming for his mother. And he was a 70-year-old man. That does not have to happen today. Because we have moved to the point in time where our medications, especially our opioids, which are the morphine-related drugs and associated compounds, we have them and we can control them enough to alleviate the pain that occurs at the end of life. Now what is very striking when I talk to patients and then to doctors and their healthcare providers is that there is a fear that administering these medications 
will in fact involve intentional killing. And so there are a lot of people, especially, and this is the irony, pro-life, deeply Catholic people are often scared that they will com- in somehow violate the moral norm protect, preventing the killing of innocent life by giving people these drugs. And so we need very... I, so the, I need to make sure that you understand that it is morally permissible to give someone all the medication that he or she needs to alleviate their pain. That's really important. That's like take-home message number one. And that no one here should be fearful that administering these medications could in fact be an act of killing. Now, in order to help you understand this, I need to talk about the principle of double effect. The principle of double effect is an ancient moral principle. Even Aquinas has some form of this principle. And Aquinas, of course, 800 years ago. And it's a common sense moral intuition. And the example that I use in class is the following. You know, when you were a kid and you're biking, you fell off and you gashed your leg and your mom gets iodine. And what do you do? Screaming your bloody lungs out. <laughs> right? And she is taking that eye. Ah! And you're, and now, normally, if a mother causes her child to scream bloody murder, we would consider that, well, especially today, abuse. <laughs> abuse of some sort. And yet we understand that when she is applying the iodine and her little daughter is yelling and screaming, mom is actually doing an act of charity there. She's actually caring for her daughter even though her daughter is basically writhing in apparent pain. Now, of course, little kids love attention, so we're not quite sure how much of that yelling and screaming is dramatics in addition to pain. But having said that, we recognize, we recognize that it's okay for that mom to apply the iodine to the wound even if daughter is screaming and she's in fact causing pain to her child. And the, 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 the moral principle that lies behind that intuition is the principle of double effect. It is the recognition that sometimes when you act, your actions both have good effects and bad effects simultaneously. So in this particular case, as mom is disinfecting wound, the good effect is the disinfecting of the wound and the bad effect is screaming kid, bloody murder kid, you know, who is like yelling and screaming. So you have this, both the good in effect and the bad effect. Now how do we then justify that? We say that there are four criteria that regulate actions that have both bad effects and good effects. So the first one is that the effect on the action understood in itself is a good one, or at least morally neutral. And disinfecting a wound is a good act. Right? The first one. The second one is that you mustn't intend the evil effect. So the the mom mustn't be like, oh, I love it when you're screaming. Okay? That would be a problem. That would, in fact, I remember, my mom would cry too. Uh, It's one of those things that I remember when I was a kid, you know. My screaming would cause her pain that she'd be crying as she put the eye... And you can tell, so she did not want me to experience pain. So the second one is you can't intend, you cannot intend or choose or desire the evil effect. The ster- and, and of course, the, the, the corollary to that is you must desire the good effect. You must, in fact, want to clean up the wound. The third thing is that the good effect cannot come about as a direct result of the evil effect. Because if you, if you have to have the evil effect to attain the good effect, then you necessarily must desire and want the evil effect. You see that second criteria where you don't want, so you actually cannot 
you cannot desire the, the evil effect. Well, if the evil effect is necessary for the production of the good effect, you're going to violate that second principle. In this case, of course, my yelling and screaming has nothing to do with the efficacy of the disinfection. And so the infection would occur even if I was knocked unconscious. And so the evil effect is actually independent of the good effect. And so you can, in fact, desire just the good effect alone without the evil effect. And finally, there has to be some proportion. They have to be comparable. So my yelling and screaming is comparable to, well, the disinfection of my room and hopefully, you know, I don't get sepsis and I don't die. And so there's a comparable. It becomes proportionate. There's a proportionate, proportionate, proportionate relationship between the evil effect and the good effect. And so when those four conditions apply, the moral tradition understands that what you're doing here is you are choosing to do a good act that has unintended but foreseen evil effects that we can endure but we do not necessarily choose. And so this framework can be applied to end-of-life issues associated with pain. Because you see, when you provide, when you provide that opioid to alleviate the pain of your patient, what you want is to alleviate that pain. Now, there is in some cases, a hastening of death simply because opioids by their very nature can lead to that. Now there's actually anecdotal evidence that if it is done gradually, if the amount of opioid that is administered to the patient is done in such a way that the body adapts over time, you do not have the suppression of respiration that is often associated with um, the acceleration of death. But you notice, just like in the case of the mom who's disinfecting the wound, what the healthcare professional is desiring is the alleviation of the pain. And so because we allevi we're desiring the alleviation of the pain, this hastening, shortening of, of life, a few days maybe, is something that we simply endure. Now, one of the things that I, that come, a question that often arises when I speak to healthcare professionals is, how do you know the person is not intending to accelerate the death of his patient? Especially today where we have cost concerns, we have um, a culture that is unfortunately so much more open to euthanasia and physician-assisted suicide that, for example, Patients in the Netherlands actually have to write up certain documents before they enter the hospital to protect themselves against possible killing, ending of their life by their doctors. So in the Netherlands, we now have a situation that patients actually have to protect themselves. They have to be very explicit about what cannot be done to them to accelerate the die their dying only because the culture there has got to the point where euthanasia and physician-assisted suicide is perceived to be legally and morally acceptable. So how then do you, do you deal with that situation, right? So, I mean, here we're talking primarily about um, a, a doctor, a nurse who is providing opioids. How do you know that this doctor is not, in fact, committing an act of physician-assisted suicide. And the question is, well, look at what the doctor is doing. So in the case, in the case of the mother who's disinfecting the wound of her, of her child, if the mother is basically disinfecting the wound of the child for two hours, you would wonder, is she really disinfecting the wound of the child or does she derive great pleasure from the suffering of her child. You can see what she's doing. What she's doing reveals the intentions in her heart. So if a doctor is prescribing 10 times the minimum dose to alleviate the pain of his patients, then you would wonder, in fact, you should question 
whether or not the doctor is in fact simply alleviating pain. And when I've talked to physicians and nurses, there is a standard of care. People are aware of what, of the, of the minimum amount of medication that should be given to a particular patient given the medical circumstances of that, that, that that patient is experiencing. There is a, a standard of care that sets the standard for how much you give. And so that should be what the physician the nurse, the NP gives. And if they give more than that, then you wonder about their intentions. But you see, there is not this fuzziness about physician-assisted suicide versus the alleviation of pain. So we should not necessarily fear, in fact, we should not fear at all that if we truly simply want to alleviate the pain of our patient, we should be able to prescribe what is necessary to alleviate, it, alleviate that pain, knowing that it's an act of mercy and charity. Now what about terminal sedation? So there are situations where uh, the pain is so great that you actually have to knock out the patient. And um, this has occurred a couple of times while I was serving as a chaplain, so the ethics question. again. It's the minimum that's required to alleviate the pain. And sometimes the minimum that is required to alleviate that pain leads to the person being very, very much heavily sedated. And again, you have to ask, in this particular circumstance with this patient dealing with this particular issue, is that the standard of care that you would need to provide uh, to that patient? Now, it's striking because uh, the Catholic Church, the Catholic moral tradition recognizes that dying is a moment of great grace. And so if you look at the catechism of the Catholic Church, there is always, in a sense, the default mode is to try to keep the patient as conscious as possible all the way to the end of life. The idea that we as rational creatures, it is proper and fitting for us to, to meet death and to prepare for that encounter with the Lord fully aware. As fully aware as we are given the medical condition that we have. And so when I've talked to people, I say, you know, if it is absolutely necessary to sedate, then sedate. But if it's not absolutely necessary and the patient is not asking for it, don't think that you necessarily have to sedate the patient. And the, the concern too is that there are sometimes healthcare professionals who believe that sedation is the key just because now the patient is worry free. And so the easiest way to calm down the patient who is agitated to allow you to deal with your other patient is to simply sedate them. And, but what, one of the things I try to impress on them is the presupposition, the default condition, because we are rational creatures who have the great dignity of knowing and loving, is that we should preserve that ability to know and to love to the very end if the patient requests it and if the patient is able to endure it uh, without unnecessarily pa unnecessary pain. So that's just something like I have to put a caveat in there because we, you know, even though sedation to alleviate pain is morally acceptable, you have to take into account this other dimension of human life as we approach death. So that's, so that's basically the natural, the natural uh, what we can do. The supernatural, of course, involves the graces, right? And you know, Mother gave me a wonderful introduction, but the most important thing about me is that I'm a priest. Who happens to be, by the grace of God, a biologist as well. But the most important thing is I'm a priest. And so as a hospital chaplain, one of the things, the reasons why we send young dads to be hospital chaplains is because if a man wants to learn about what it means for him to be a priest. He needs to deal with situations at the end of life. 
And there are so many stories. You know, I'm ordained one month. And I go in, I'll tell you this, I go in one month, and I'm paged, and all of a sudden, I go in, and the, the, there's a little petite Hispanic woman. She's like, exercise him, Father, exercise him. And her, you know, her little husband, who's like five foot three, is in the bed, and there are five large nurses and nurse aides on top of him. And he is flinging them left and right, and I'm standing there, ordained one month, and she's like, exercise him. And I'm going, I'm going through like, what did I learn in canon law about exorcisms? They never told me this in seminary, right? So all I knew is, I remember saying, you are not allowed to exercise without the permission of the bishop. I remember, I, I remember thinking that in my brain. So I said, okay, we can pray. So we pray. You know, sadly it turned out that this, her husband had Yakov Kruzfeldt syndrome, so mad cow disease. And the reason why he was super strong was actually because the disease had taken over his brain and he had basically supernatural, apparently supernatural powers. But there were stories like this where I learned, I learned about the end of life. Or you go in, and you, know, and you go into... A, a, another story, you know, it's three o'clock in the morning, you're a page, you go into a patient's room, and this is a woman from the Dominican Republic, and she's a grandmother. Her grandkids, her kids, her brothers, her sisters, there must have been 50 people <laughs> in this very small hospital room, right? And I walk in, and I realized they don't care who I am. They don't know my name, and they don't care. They don't know where I'm from, but they don't care. What they care about is I am a priest. And so I go in, and again, you know, this is, and one of the things about being a hospital chaplain is, you, there's the door, and you have to say a little prayer, because when you open that door, you have no idea what is on the other side. So, I mean, this is where I, at, you know, Our Lady, is that you just open the door, and you walk in, boof, all right, Holy Spirit, what's next? And in this particular case, I remember... I had to give permission to the woman to die. It's, it's a, um, you know, it's the spiritual preparation for death. You can give them all the drugs, you can, give, you can alleviate all the pain, but there is another, and this is what this place, this home is able to do. Right? And this is something where you go to a secular hospital in New York, Cornell Presbyterian, it's really hard. And, and one of the things I was trained as a, ho uh, as a chaplain was basically to help a family to give permission to their loved one to die. And it's, I cry, everyone cries, the doctor, it's a, one of the most amazing experience. It's a great privilege to be present at that final reconciliation where, where they're ready to go. They're ready to go. And in this case, and in many, many other cases, that has had to happen. And at the heart of this, especially for the Catholic, are the sacraments. Um, again, you know, I'll never forget this guy. I think his name was Jack. I don't remember. Um, you walk in, it was 2 o'clock in the afternoon, so it was not too crazy. I was not zoned. And it was just him, there was Jack, and there were, I think, three of his sons and a daughter and his wife. And they'd been married 60 years. And, um, you know, you go in, and at this point, uh, Jack was basically sedated. And so what, what I did is I basically said, look, um, you, you go in and you're a priest and you say, Jack, my name is Father Nick and I'm a Catholic priest and I'm here with your family and we're praying for you. And his eyes opened and we were like, whoa. Um, and he was not supposed to be up. He was supposed to be sedated. And uh, I said, Jack, do you love Jesus? <laughs> and, he, and I, are you sorry for all your sins? <laughs> and, uh, and then I gave him the absolution. And then I said, do you want to receive Holy Communion? 
<laughs> Out comes the tongue, big tongue, right? And I took a little bit, a sliver of the Lord's body, and I put it on, and I remember his wife going, Honey, you can swallow now. <laughs> and uh, he got swallowed, and I gave him the apostolic pardon. That's incredibly, uh, for me, an incredibly powerful moment, because uh, you realize that if that person cooperates with the graces that are being given to him at this point in his life, just like the, the thief on the side of the Lord's heaven is open to him and always moving, always moving. And then, uh, you know, and I, and I said, all right, Jack, uh, you're ready? You ready to go? And he looked at it and I said, your family's here, we're praying for you. And he just closed, and he died. And I was like, Lord, please, can I die like that? <laughs> and, and, it's, and, and, and it's the family, it's to prepare the family to die, to prepare the patient to die, to give them the supernatural graces that they need for the homeward journey. And you know, it's, it's, it's always fascinating to me that the last Holy Communion is viaticum, which is food for the journey. Isn't that an amazing image? You know, you're getting on the plane and you go off and get some food, especially now that they charge for everything, including the peanuts. Um, you know, you, everything. So, and here we are, he is, he is strengthened by the body of his Lord as he goes home. And so we, to prepare for the other, there's the, the natural side. And I've seen that even with the, super, once the supernatural is in place, it's amazing what patients can endure. I mean, uh, they amaze, there is such heroic, heroic virtue, and you know it's God who is keeping them together. And you know the story, this, my sisters will know this very well, the one who is waiting for someone to arrive. You know, and you tell, oh, they're going to die. So you know, their hands are cold. You know, they, they, they're breathing heavily with that rattling sound. You know, the, and then they are told, your son is coming. And I don't know where, where it comes from. They hold on to life. And they just, this is where the spirit is able to endure whatever the body is telling it. And the sun comes, there's a reconciliation. They think, you know, life is put aright, not just for the patient, but for his family. And then he goes home. And so, especially in a Catholic institution, especially for those of us who are Catholic, what we do to prepare patients to die is not just the natural, it's not just the medication, it is also, and I would suggest to you, more important especially in light of eternity, that we prepare our patients, our loved ones, our brothers, our sisters, our mothers, our fathers, and in some sad cases, even our children, to go before us. So now we turn to the question of prolonged dying. Uh, once you have the pain issue, there is the prolonged dying. And what I mean by prolonged dying is, often I encounter patients, I have encountered patients, who are exhausted. And they're not exhausted with life. They're exhausted with the medical interventions that have been, that they have had to endure for weeks, months, and sometimes years, depending upon how long they have had to deal with their terminal condition. So the standard, the classic example is the vent. A woman is intubated. The, again, healthcare professionals are scared. What can we do at the end of life for our patients that, can, that will not be construed as killing them? And so there's, there's that combination of the two. And often when it comes to medical interventions, there are two questions that use here. The first is people believe that they have to do absolutely everything especially Catholics, especially Catholics who are pro-life. The assumption is because they are pro-life, 
they have to provide for every possible care to make sure that their son, their daughter, their father, their mother, brother, sister is alive. And what I have to tell them is, no, that is not, that is not the truth of the matter. We have to do all that we can in an ordinary sense. And so this is where, from the Catholic moral tradition, you have the, what's called, in the first case with pain, we had the principle of double effect. Here we have what's called the principle of elective extraordinary means. And this is important for me to distinguish. It's important to distinguish what I mean by that. It's what, and this was articulated most magisterially by Pope Pius XII, just over 50, 50 years ago. And it is this. First of all, life and health are gifts. They are gifts from God. And so we have to be stewards of these gifts. But they are not absolute gifts. Because a time will come when we will die. And we are going to die unless the Lord comes first. But that's, that's different, right? But if for the, the normal expectation is that we will all die before His second coming. And so in that case, we have to ask this question. How can we morally judge the medical interventions that, we, that are available to us at the end of life? And this is where the distinction between ordinary and extraordinary means is important. Because the principle is this. We are morally obligated to avail ourselves of the ordinary means for the preservation of life, but not the extraordinary means. Now, one immediate response to that is a lot of people will assume that the difference between ordinary and extraordinary is a medical one. So they'll say, well, an aspirin is ordinary and, you know, a drug trial, a drug that's on cl clinical trials is actually extraordinary. And they, they think of basically medical differences. And what I have to emphasize today is that this is a moral difference. It's a moral difference between ordinary and extraordinary. And some medical interventions can be ordinary for this person now, but extraordinary for that person now. The exact same medical intervention could be ordinary for this person today, but that very same medical intervention could, should be, could become extraordinary tomorrow. So it is not the medical intervention per se. It is the medical intervention as it is understood as a burden or a benefit. And that's really what's important. Because what has to happen is you have to ask, is this medical intervention of benefit or of burden? And the person who is called to make that judgment is the patient. And the reason why is because it's the patient who is ultimately given the gifts of life and health from our Lord. And so it's the patient who is the steward of his life and his health. And so what has to happen is we need to ask, the, if a patient is asking, you know, can I refuse this medical intervention? Then the question you have to ask is, do you find that this intervention is beneficial or burdensome? Let me illustrate that with an example from my own experience. And I'm going to go back to a vent. It's a story that I use all the time. I met a patient, terminal uh, condition, who was on a vent. But her daughter was getting married in three weeks. And no matter what, she was going to be there to watch her daughter married. So her vent was beneficial it was for, and she made the judgment that at that point in time, that vent was allowing her to live long enough for her to see her son-in-law and her daughter married. And so she endured that vent. She could not speak to anyone. She simply endured that vent. They got married, exchanged vows in front of her, their mom, and one, everyone was crying. Now the marriage is done. 
The woman decided a few days later that the vent was now extraordinary. And what, what she had made the judgment is she wanted to tell her loved ones that she loved them. And she found that that vent could not allow her to speak to them. And so what we did is she made the moral judgment that at this time and place, this medical intervention, the, the ventilation, was really burdensome. She could not see the benefit out of it. It was really just simply prolonging her life. She, she could never come off of it ever again because of her terminal condition. So she, she knew it was just extending the inevitable and she wanted the time and the place to say goodbye. And so what happened is her family gathered around her. The vent was removed. She had a few minutes to simply laugh for a laugh and to just tell them how much she loved them before eventually she died. Now you see, it was the same intervention. It was the, same. the ventilation had not changed. And her condition, though gradually deteriorating, was not dramatically different before and after the wedding. What was striking is that she had made the judgment that the benefits and the burdens calculation, if you, if you can call it, was such that for first it was beneficial, later it was not. And so when we come and we talk about medical interventions at the end of life, we need to ask this question. Is it beneficial? Is it burdensome? And we have to be careful that we are judging the benefit and burden of the medical intervention and not the patient's life. Some, in our culture today, there is a temptation to think that because the patient is an invalid, because the patient is now a burden on everybody else, that now we can judge that medical intervention to be burdensome. That is not what we're talking about here. We are talking about judging the medical intervention. So I need to say a few things about artificial hydration and nutrition. So uh, this is a very uh, controversial area. And, and basically the question is, can, is providing food and water to one of our brothers and sisters in need, when can we consider that burdensome? When can we consider that beneficial? And it's very clear, especially in light of a statement that the Holy Father, John Paul II, now blessed John Paul II, pointed out in about seven years ago, is that providing food and drink to someone else is something we do in the ordinary context of life. And so, Providing food and drink, nourishment, to someone where that food and nourishment is still beneficial to them is ordinary means. And it's very important because at the very end of life, one of the things that you discover is that the, as the body begins to shut down, water and even food can in fact become detrimental and toxic. And at that point, Right At that point, the benefit, which is nourishing the body, is gone. And so at that point, it is morally acceptable to withdraw artificial hydration and nutrition because they're not hydrating and they're not nourishing at this point. And so they become burdensome and extraordinary. But other than that, especially in light of scenarios where patients have been provided artificial hydration and nutrition at home, the burden and the benefits are such that the benefits, the life of this person still outweighs the burden of sometimes the inconvenience and sometimes the great inconvenience that might be present in, this, in that situation. And we can, you, if you have any questions about that, we can talk about that later. And now, for the final part of this question, the DNR. So, something that comes up a lot as a hospital chaplain, as my, my postulate as a bioethicist is, how do we deal with a DNR? So a DNR is a code status, it's a do not resuscitate. And in those cases when a person is in DNR, there is an understanding that if that patient codes, if their heart stops, 
the doctors and nurses and healthcare providers will not attempt to resuscitate that person, which is why it's a DNR, do not resuscitate. How do we understand that? And a lot of patients are sometimes wary of this, and um, something I talk about to doctors and nurses is DNR is do not resuscitate. It does not mean do not respond. Because sometimes in hospital situations, what in my experience is that once someone is on DNR, there is an assumption, well, they're dying anyway, so if they click their little call button, well, I can afford to delay the response because they're on DNR. And so there's that concern. You see, there's that concern. So you have to educate you have to educate the healthcare providers that DNR does not mean do not respond. It just means that this person has decided, and you see this is where it is, this person has decided that the medical intervention that involves cardiac resuscitation constitutes extraordinary means. And there's enough empirical studies that show evidence-based work that show that in many terminal conditions, resuscitation is not ultimately successful. Now, what do I mean by that? Will they be able to bring that person, resuscitate their heart? Yes. But if you look at the numbers, how, what percentage of patients who've been resuscitated leave the hospital, return home? Practically zero. So, so from, from the, the evidence suggests that in, in many cases of chronic and terminal illness at the end of life, when a person is resuscitated, they're simply resuscitated for a few more days. That they are not able to recover their health completely such that they're able to leave the hospital. Well, in light of that evidence, you can see where a patient could be reasonable in saying, look, it's okay. And for those who've actually witnessed a resuscitation, it can be incredibly, not only physically traumatic, you have bruised ribs and broken ribs and all sorts of things. But psychologically, emotionally, it's incredibly, uh, can be very, very difficult for, pay, for pay families to see their loved one undergo this. And so when patients tell me, they say, can I go on a deal? I say, well, let's talk about it. And at this point, it's not because they say, I want to die or I want to kill myself. That's rare. What they're saying is, Father, I'm ready. I'm tired. Usually they'll say, I'm tired. Yeah. I'm just tired. I'm ready to go. I've gotten a confession. I've said goodbyes. I said, I want to go. And then sometimes they'll say, I heard it's beautiful. <laughs> and I go, absolutely. From everything we've heard and thought through, it is the most, God is the most beautiful thing you will ever see. And they're like, yeah, I'm looking forward to seeing the sunset. And I'm going, it's going to be an amazing sunset. And so you can see how when they choose to go on the DNR, um, they've actually made a moral judgment that allows them to go. Now, when I go, so I, I also sit on an um, ethics committee and ethics consultation for a group of hospitals in Rhode Island, Catholic hospitals, and one of the things is they have, pr I'm helping them, things that we're doing to try to make sure that, that person, so they used to have a DNR room, so if you went on DNR, you would send to the top floor of the hospital into this room, it's like, whoa, wait a minute, you know, that is, that's a bend, you may not think you're doing it, but the patient perceives it as, I am being like abandoned and sent off to the middle of nowhere. So you have the death room. I mean, come on, who wants to go to the death room? And so one of the things that hospitals are, these hospitals are trying to do is, well, once you go on DNR, they're going to maintain, you know, you're in the same place with the same doctors and nurses, but everyone is aware that you are preparing to go home and everyone's ready. And, you know, and it's a great thing because what happens actually, I've been in situations where it's striking to see when families discover that you see death as they're going home, they start becoming the messenger boy. <laughs> you know, the nurses say, I need you to tell my dad, when you see my dad, I need you to tell my dad that we're okay and that we love him. And it becomes an incredibly healing moment because they're ready to go and people are telling them, all right, 
I've got all these things, and I, and I, t I always tell them, I say, your dad knows. <laughs> you know, it's not, it's not like he's on the other side. Your dad knows. He's seeing God, we hope and pray. And, when, and so because God knows, because he sees God, he knows. He knows better than you and me. They're like, really? I'm like, oh yeah. <laughs> he knows. God, God. So there is a sense where at the end of life we can, we can reassure our brothers and sisters, our patients, that they do not have to have this extended, this extended prolonged dying. Precisely because there is this distinction between extraordinary and ordinary care. Now to conclude, just a couple of minutes. How are we called to prepare for that? Now I noticed that there are these wonderful brochures out there from the New York uh, Catholic uh, Bishops Conference and they're, they're wonderful. I hope you have a chance to look at them. Um, what's really most important and this is especially for the past year and a half that I have served on the uh, ethics advisory board for the Catholic hospitals in Rhode Island. You, you really need to think about death. You need to at least have a proxy. And, and what I mean by that is a proxy is someone who you designate as someone who will speak in your place if at the end of your life you are unable to speak for yourself. And it's important that you speak to someone to tell them about um, what you want in terms of care. Now, it turns out that I am the healthcare proxy for numerous brothers in my province because <laughs> They're like, you're bioethicist. You make sure that nothing is done to me. And so let me call you. So they'll call me up and my brother will say, okay, this is what I want done. This is what I don't want done. Da, 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 da. And so we talk. And basically, you know, I have a healthcare um, proxy. One of my brothers is also a healthcare proxy for me as well as our superiors. So we have it set up. So all the friars in my province, we've all signed our healthcare proxies. Uh, so that our superiors will be able to help us uh, at the end of our life and that we will have one of our brothers who will speak on our behalf if we do not, if we're unable to speak. And basically one of the things we say, you know, the things we usually say is, I ask, I ask to die at home, if possible, at one of our priories, or in this home. <laughs> Mother, remember? <laughs> So I said, either one of my whole, uh, one of our priors or one of the sisters' homes, these three. And, uh, and if possible, uh, with the Lord. And then I say, everything else can be done as long as it's morally permissible according to the teachings of the Catholic Church. <laughs> that's really, that's, that's kind of like the copy, it covers absolutely everything. And my brother, who's a healthcare proxy, at least will know, you know, and this will enable him to act in a way to protect the integrity of my vows at the end of our in the, at the end of in, at the end of my life, so you've got healthcare proxy. That's one, and then there's basically you know you can call it whatever. It's a it's a written directive. It's an advanced directive, and there are numerous ways that you can write advanced directives. And usually, what I what, when when uh, patients talk to me about this, I say the healthcare proxy is the more important of the two because. You cannot anticipate everything that could happen to you at the end of your life. The end of your life in the providence of God is known only to Him. So if you list out all the things that you think could happen, either you unnecessarily limit your healthcare proxy because you have indicated something that you say, well, I don't want this done, but you didn't take into account that there's this special circumstance because of your medical condition where, in fact, this should be done morally to you. So I say, you know, do an advanced directive. Usually, um, and there is a couple that different Catholic bishops' conferences have put forward to, in a sense, a draft document that you could look at. The National Catholic Bioethics Center in Philadelphia also has one online that you could print out and sign. But the more important one is to have a healthcare proxy, someone who can speak on your behalf, and someone who is familiar with the moral framework that you want to have your healthcare managed under. Right? You, so, I, so I tell my friends, I say, well, you know, you don't want to choose your atheist, anti Catholic cousin to be your healthcare proxy. I mean, it. 
it will cause problems at the end of life. You need to have a healthcare proxy who shares the, the worldview that you have, who understands you, who can speak on your behalf rather than on what he or she personally thinks. And this is someone you have to entrust your dying to. So if you, you know, if you entrust your dying to someone, that's someone you should trust quite a lot. And so that's how I, 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 I tell, um, tell people. I say, have someone designated as your healthcare proxy, and then if you have to, print out one of these advanced directives, uh, living wills, you can name, there, there's many different ways you can call them. Fill them out, discuss it with your healthcare proxy uh, to make sure that there's uh, uh, a, that, that, that your healthcare proxy understands what you write. And if you're a Catholic and you wish to die protecting the integrity of your life as a Catholic, then just write that down. Make sure you indicate that you would like all medical interventions that are in accordance with uh, the teachings of the Catholic Church. All you have to do is say that and it will empower your healthcare proxy basically to say no, this, in, this involves euthanasia, this involves physician assisted suicide and I know that my brother would not want that to be done to him and it says so right there, he's a Catholic, he, 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 wants, he wants all the care that is given to him to be done in such a way that it respects the integrity of his Catholic life. And at the end, pray. Uh, if you want to, what is the, the for 2,000 years, the doctors, the saints the, of the church have said, the best preparation for death is a virtuous life. Is to live with God's grace and in his power to the best of your abilities right, and under his mercy, and to live that every day. I mean, and it's striking, I, I, told, I preached a retreat um, to the sisters in their home in Atlanta earlier this year, I said, it is striking that every single night when the church prays Compline, when the church prays Compline, we are asked to reflect on our death. Because the proper way to live, I mean, this is the, the paradox of Christianity. The Christian says that if you want to live, you have to live knowing you will die. And it's only when you know that you're going to die and you live that way that your life is fullest, your life is richest, your, your life is most joyful. Right? Because it's all about Christ. Amen. Amen. Any questions? Yes, ma'am. Um, I thought that your description of the burdens of medical intervention was very clear and easy to understand. But when it bec where it becomes a little cloudy for me is when you look at church teaching, like the Vatican Declaration on Euthanasia, and it says burdens can be economic, mm -hmm. for example. Like so does that mean that a patient can just decide this particular medical intervention is too costly, therefore it's a burden? All right, let me give you an example. This is a very real case, actually. So you have a father who's 45. He has uh, medulloblastoma or glioblastoma multiform. So it's a very invasive brain tumor. All right? Now, um, they tell him that he could have surgery, but because of his insurance status, it's going to cost him his entire life savings. And he has four kids, and they're still in high school. And he's going, he, he knows he has to go, he has to provide for them. And so he makes a decision. He makes a decision. He says, I, I could have the surgery, and it's going to give me maybe seven more months of life but I'm going to empty the coffers and I'm going to, but I'm going to make the decision that I'm ready. I'm ready to go. Now, for most people on the planet who don't have the finances, that's what they would have to, dis that's what they would have decided by necessity because they cannot afford it. So they die. 
we cannot afford all the care that we could possibly receive. And so it is not unreasonable to bring financial decisions into the equation. Now what is, we have to be very, very careful. Because now you have a situation where you have an elderly patient who now wants to actually accelerate her death so that she will not be a financial burden on her family. Now that's a different situation. But I wanted to illustrate to you in a situation in that case, and that's a very real case, where we routinely make decisions based on financial issues for our health. Um, and that, that carries all the way to the end of our life. And really what you have to examine is, you have to examine and talk to the patient. Um, what are the motivating desires, really? What are, the, are they virtuous ones or are they vicious ones? And it, it, it comes down to, there are these principles that I can outline, but at the end of the day, when you get down to the, the, this situation, there are so many possible variations of it that you have to sit down and listen to the patient. I mean, what I do primarily as an ethicist when I'm called in is I listen. And I'm listening for, I'm listening for virtue. I'm actually listening for holiness. And, when, and, and you can hear that. You can also hear vice. You can hear vice. You can hear fear. And when you hear fear, you have to deal with that fear. And what you have to try to do is you've try, you have to try to ensure that they, they as in the patients, are provided all that they can have so that they can make a virtuous decision. Does that make sense to you? It does, but your example though of the 45 year old man is, is a very clear one, is a very stark one. I think probably more often they're less... Right, it, oh, they're less it's clear. called life. Yeah. <laughs> and that's why we have to pray. You know what I mean? I mean, I, I give the clear examples to show you that it's possible. But now you go into, it's your mother. She's 67. You're, you're fearful. You're grieving. All of these emotions come into play. Your, your brain is clouded. You don't have the clarity. What happens? That's a different situation. And that's where, really, uh, hopefully, you have someone there who can provide clarity to the question. And at least, I, like my, my suggestion is always, you know, I listen. The most important thing you can do to a dying patient is to listen. And to listen to discover what exactly is going on right there and how can you best prepare them to die because you see in that situation the 45 year old man you can see how it's virtue he's being a dad and I would rather him enter into eternity knowing that he has done all that he could do to provide for his kids than have him go into eternity worried for their well-being and so you understand and so you listen to them and you go what are their concerns? Are they legitimate concerns? How can I alleviate their concerns? Are they suicidal? Now, you can also hear, are they suicidal? Well, if they're suicidal, what can we do to alleviate uh, those concerns that are making them suicidal? So again, it's, I, I apologize. It's hard for me to kind of like pin it down, but I just wanted to show you that, that economic concerns can be, but it depends on the circumstances. And it becomes even more tricky when there's a surrogate decision. Oh, oh, it's because tricky because now the surrogate is thinking it's my money going into their care, right? Which is why it's really important. I think the, the one of the things I wanted to emphasize is the ultimate decision first resides with the patient, and then a patient surrogate. And hopefully, you see, this is why I tell people. I'm going to tell you guys. If you don't have a surrogate, someone is going to be designated a surrogate for you. So it's not that you can go through life and say, I will not have a surrogate. That's just, it's either someone you choose or someone who is chosen for you. And I, you would prefer someone that you choose so that you know that this person will respect the virtues and the, 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 just your, your beliefs and your convictions in a way that someone else who's chosen for you, especially if it's a lawyer. I mean, you know, it's, it's a completely different can of worms. But you're correct. It, it is very complicated. Other questions? You're all ready. <laughs> yes? Father, um, thank you. That was, that was wonderful talk.
and also, um, you know, I never thought about the fear of a caretaker fearing their, um, uh, of fearing that they won't go to heaven if they make a certain decision, you know, for somebody. I, I, you know, well, often it is not, usually when I've encountered that, it's not necessarily that way. Usually it's, will I be sued? Okay, yeah. So, 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 so there's a more primal, there's a more primal, but then when you explore it, especially if they are men and women of integrity and of conscience, they too are worried, right? They want to, do, especially when you meet, especially in this hospital, it's a teaching hospital, so, and so I meet the young idealistic doctors and nurses, and they honestly want to save lives. Now, what I have to tell them so often is after, so often they'll just stop me in the hall and say, I need to go talk to you. And see, they see death as failure. Because when someone dies, they didn't cure, so they failed. And, and um, you know, people will tell them, get over it. Well, no, it's not something you have to, it's not something you get over. It's something that you must learn to integrate into your life, as a into your vocation as a healthcare provider. And you have to understand, so one of the things I tell people, doctors and nurses, I say, you may not necessarily be able to cure, but you can always heal. You can always accompany your patients as they die. And it seems like you, you know, you, you mentioned it numerous times about, and I, and I can understand it, if you go through life and you make a decision um, with a love-based decision instead of a fear-based decision, it seems to work that way. If you can think about the resident or the patient, what would they want? What is the loving thing to do instead of what am I fearful of or what, you know, that kind of a thing. One of the things when you read Genesis and you read about Adam and Eve, when they sinned, one of the first responses to sin is they have become fearful of God. Mm -hmm. They are ashamed. And I think for most of, most of us, Life is driven, unfortunately, primarily by fear. We are, we are afraid of many, many things, and we live in such a way to minimize those fears impinging upon us. And what the Gospel is promising us, and our Lord is saying is, right, I have come to set you free, and setting free primarily from the fear, and when He talks about fear, the number one fear He's talking about is the fear of death. And Aquinas will say that, all fear in some way is a reflection of that fear of death. If we were not going to, if we didn't die, in a sense, most of our fears would be alleviated. But because, that, because of death, and this is the effect of sin, because of death, that we, we, at the very core of our being, we are afraid. And the Lord came to die and to rise from the dead to reassure us through His life that that fear even though natural is not the end of the story. And yet, you know, when I tell my students, I say, look, you've got it. What are you most scared of? If you, most of us, if you want to know what's driving your life, you've got to go, what, is, what are you most scared of? And then how can the Lord heal that and give you hope? And then you'll be able to move forward. Many people don't know that. They don't know what is the driving fear that is either, most of the time, holding them back. Any other questions? Yes, ma'am. Um, do you extend the same thought process or the same discernment to um, an insurance company who, de who makes a decision that it's very that the burden to all of the covered people is so great that they are justified in limiting uh, certain types of care? Um, I don't know that much about the insurance company, especially because it's undergoing so much change in recent years. They're a business model, you know, and so they're driven, when you think about it, it's sad to say, but the reality is that most insurance companies are in the business not of providing health care to their patients, but making a profit. So, um, they're going to make a calculation based on statistics. Now one of the things that I hope that you can see when I try to illustrate in an earlier question is that bioethics, moral theology is not about these 
abstract principles. It's what to do here and now with this other human being, a son, a daughter of God, one of your brothers and sisters. And so when we're talking about companies or governments, it's much harder to talk about specifics, right? So let's say, I mean, are you concerned like a medical company say, well, we, we're going to, for us to provide the insurance that you seek, you cannot, after a certain point in time, you cannot X, Y, or Z. Is that what you're, what are you imagining? I'm just imagining um, certain types of procedures that are costly. And if their mentality is such that we, the greater good is served by not doing everything that we could do to, to help the broad base of the people that we cover. We have an obligation to everyone to give it a certain amount of care and not, um, not have to extend uh, a greater amount of care. But, but you notice the, company, the insurance company is not saying that we will not provide that care for you. It's saying that if you wish to seek that care, you need to provide to pay for it on your own. Right, so, and in a sense, you are free to decide whether or not you take that insurance policy. And taking that insurance policy, you say that this insurance policy is something that I agree with. So the moral question, it's the same thing like buying a car, right? Um, when you buy a car, you want all the parts to be working. And if I bought a car from you, and you basically... Uh, didn't tell me that part of the car was not working, it's unjust for me, for you, it's, an unju it's an injustice for you to sell me that car defective in some way because I didn't, without you telling it to me. But if you told me that you know, the carburetor is not working correctly and I still pay for that, that's justice. There is a sense of where I'm getting what you told me. So the question you're asking is, for the patient, if the patient agrees to buy this insurance policy, and knowing that this is the insurance policy that he is buying, in a sense, there is no injustice there because he is providing, he is paying for and getting what he got back. Now, this, this raises the question of just health care in general. And the Catholic Church is very clear that there are certain things that the, in the common good that we need to provide for each other. So, public school system is a good thing. It's a public school system is good because education, seeking the truth, is a good thing. So, in fact, when people have asked me about the health care debate, I say, well, as a Catholic, I'm convicted by the truth that we are obligated as a society to provide for each other's needs in a particular way. Now, Church teaching does not say how it's going to be provided for. Should it be a socialized medical system? Should it be uh, an insurance uh, money given to each individual so that he or she can buy insurance? That's not part of what the Catholic Church teaches. But what the Catholic Church, Church teaches is that we are not individuals walking this walk home by ourselves. We're, we're doing this together. We're part of God's family. And so as part of God's family, we have to help each other, especially those who are poor and marginalized, uh, who are unable to get certain things that are needed for them, that we should help them out. Now, how we help them out, that's a different story. And that's a political question rather than a moral one. So um, all, all I can say, I think, to respond to your question is, it would not be an injustice if the patient was aware at the time that he or she purchased the, uh, the insurance policy that this particular treatment was not included in the coverage. Um, what would be unjust is if there was an understanding at the time that the person adopted this policy that this would be included and then down, the, down you know, a few days later, a few months later, a few years later, they discover in fact it's been yanked out without their knowledge. That would, I think, be an injustice. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Um, my brother died two years ago at the age of 47. And unfortunately, when the hospital called me to come down because they knew he was dying, they only called my cell phone, so I wasn't able to be there. But he, he, had, he died from alcoholism. He was in the nursing home for a couple of years. But he told my aunt that he knew he wasn't going to be here on Thursday. And... Um, 
As it turns out, he went into the hospital on a Monday from a fall, got discharged back to the nursing home, and he has fallen again on Wednesday, went back to, and then went back to St. Joe's. And um, that morning I got the call, and I was, I was really distraught that I wasn't able to be there because, you know, I, I don't sleep with my cell phone. They never tried calling my home number. Anyway, it just came to me before as you were talking that since maybe he had a knowing that he wouldn't be around much longer, and even though he was alone, maybe he was he received that grace and that comfort supernaturally that no one else could have given him, and I think maybe he was able to to leave and go home. I have, look, my first thing I have to tell you is God is merciful. I mean, if there's anything I can tell you right now is in Christ our Lord, He is merciful. I always tell, I, I am also the chaplain of a prison up in Norfolk, Massachusetts. And one of the things I tell uh, the inmates is that I will never forget that the very first person to enter heaven was a murderer, a thief, probably a liar of the world, and he was the very first person to enter heaven. Ahead of all the saints. And I think the Lord wanted us to take that to heart. That, you know, especially his mom. I can guarantee you that all from all that we know about God, how God works, and how his mother is powerful. She is a Jewish mom. <laughs> you know, I'll never, she's a Jewish mom. That your brother, we can be reassured right um, he was given whatever graces he needed at that time and that's the first thing I'd like the second thing I'd like to tell you is just because your brother has died does not mean that you can say your goodbyes even today you in fact you if you if you because of the circumstances of his death you are not able to say you say goodbyes. Go to the chapel. Go to the altar of the Lord. That is where heaven and earth touch. Talk to him then, if you have not yet done so. Tell him everything that you needed to tell him, and God, in His mercy, will allow him to hear that. It's all about God. I mean, if we talk about end of life, I was going. It's God. It's got to end. Begin with God. It's got to end with God. It's all God. Any other questions?